you're uh, very lucky. We're here with um, the Northwest Atlantic Seal Research Consortium. And uh, I'm very happy to be hosting this. My name is Yvonne Valencourt. I'm the director of the Nantucket Field Station. And uh, we offer summer courses and other courses uh, at other times of the year. We also support a wide range of research, uh, some of it through the University of Massachusetts. We are a UMass Boston um, facility and are managed through the School for the Environment. Um, the researchers you're hearing from tonight uh, all are from different institutions and have used our field station. Um, and normally that's in the middle of the winter. So it's a great uh, treat to see all three of them uh, act tonight here, even though it'd be nicer to all be in person on Nantucket. Um, I would uh, like to also go over how this will work this evening. If you're tuning in on YouTube, you can uh, pose questions using the talk chat. And uh, how this will work is I'll introduce each of the three speakers and they will talk one after the other. Um, and then we will have a second segment to the event, which will be a question and answer period. And um, if you're asking questions, type them into the chat box and it would be great if you could direct them to the person you would like to answer the question and indicate if you would like them all to uh, give an, an answer or participate in a discussion around that question. We'll do our best to answer everybody's questions. Um, and uh, yeah, I would like to begin by introducing our first speaker. Stephanie Wood is someone I've known for a couple of decades, which is um, also probably as long as she's been studying gray seals. And so it's a real treat to uh, introduce Stephanie. She's a seal biologist at the University of Massachusetts in Boston. And um, take it away, Steph. All right, great, thank you. Let me get my slides going here. Hopefully that looks okay. Um, thank you to Yvonne for inviting me to uh, participate in this virtual webinar. Um, I am very disappointed that I am not on Nantucket to, to, to actually give this talk, but I appreciate being there virtually. So thank you, Yvonne. Um, so I am going to talk a bit about um, both the extirpation or local extinction and then recovery of gray seals in the Northeast. US. Um, and as Yvonne mentioned, I, I've been interested in seals really all my life and in gray seals for, for a couple of decades now. Um, and I, I, I find seals just really interesting. Um, you know, they sort of spend half their life at sea and half their life on land and they have the ability to move through these two different environments. And I think they can provide a really interesting window into processes that are happening in both those places. Uh, and the gray seal story of recovery in particular is really a great conservation success story. And I think it also can maybe help us to, to think about or think of it as a model for other species and what's happening um, in recovery stories for other populations and species. Um, so just to sort of back up um, in time, uh, when we think about the recovery of the gray seals, um, we need to sort of go back and think about, well, what was their sort of historic presence? And so if we turn to archeological records, and you can see here by all the little dots on the uh, map, we can find gray seal remains in Native American shell middens from down East Maine, so way over here. Um, all the way down into Long Island Sound to a site near New Haven. And so we know from this information that gray seals were historically distributed along the Northeast US coastline. And so they are part of the historic and natural ecosystem here. All right, and so 
In addition to archaeological records, we also have some information from um, early Europeans, and um, there's one writing that described a bounty of gray seals around Muskegon Island in the late 1600s. And some of you down there on Nantucket have maybe been over to Muskegon. So this is a picture of a, a Muskegon beach during the pupping season there, and you can see moms and pups and males. And so we know that there was a fairly uh, significant population also of gray seals in the Northeast US. Uh, but over time, that bounty of gray seals became a bounty on seals in general, both gray and harbor seals. And the, there were state bounties in both Maine and Massachusetts. And then there were local bounties in various coastal towns as well. And so these bounties, um, the way they worked was someone would be paid between one and five dollars for killing a seal. You'd turn in either a nose or a tail. Um, and in their 2009 article, Laley et al. estimated that over 40,000 bounties were paid on seals. Um, during basically the 1800s into the early to mid 1900s. Now we know that there was some cheating on the bounties and someone would take a pelt and turn that into three or four or five tails. So the numbers are not you know, completely reliable as, as sort of hard numbers, but certainly what this shows us is there was a significant amount of hunting pressure on these populations that really led to their extirpation to the point where by the 20th century, mid to late mid 20th century, gray seals were extremely rare and harbor seals were quite quite rare as well. Um, Statewide, uh, Massachusetts uh, passed a protection law in 1965, which protected gray seals because people became concerned that, that they really were not seen anymore. And then of course, in 1972, the Federal Marine Mammal Protection Act was passed, which also um, gave additional protection to these populations. So that was sort of the, the lead up to their decline. Um, but towards the latter part of the 20th century, things started to change. Um, and this of course is right in your backyard. This is a, a aerial shot of Muskegon Island from I believe it was January of 2002 when there was lots of ice. Um, and so probably if any of you have been out there, you know how quickly it changes. So that's why it might look different today than what you've seen before. Um, but probably people are aware, or maybe you're aware that um, the earliest uh, recolonization in terms of gray seal popping happened on Muskegon Island. And it was documented by a woman named Valerie Rowe who really spent a good two decades out um, studying the gray seals and really studying their return. And it's thanks to her work that we have a lot of information about the early part of this recovery. Um, this is some, <clears throat> excuse me, these are some uh, pictures from early reports from Valerie. And in addition to just providing some foundational information, which Valerie's studies did for both Muskegon and Monomoy, she spent a lot of time taking detailed information about the individual animals that she was able to see. Um, and so again, there were only a handful of animals at this time, not the thousands that some of us are used to seeing. But one important thing that she found was that some of the individuals had either individual brands or tags that told her that they had been born on Sable Island. So she was observing animals breeding on Muskegon and Monomoy and having their pups there, but she knew that their history was they were actually born on Sable Island. And I'm gonna circle back to that. So remember that piece. Um, likewise with Valerie in Maine, Jim Gilbert, um, was the person who was out looking for gray seals along the main coast and he documented the recovery there and so that's a picture from about a million years ago of me and Jim after an aerial survey flight. Um, the way we, we cover a lot of seals is um, sometimes we do ground surveys but depending on where the islands are to really get a good view and cover a lot of space we use aerial surveys. Um, so this is a picture of Green Island here um, and this is an island in Maine that's near Mount Desert Island and Jim actually found puffing on Green Island in 1994 and so both Valerie and Jim's early work was really um, important in terms of describing the recovery of this population. And then, of course, additional people um, and additional collaborate collaborators came in. Um, the Northeast Fisheries Science Center spent a lot of the 2000s continuing with a lot of these aerial surveys. Um, and I, Dre is going to talk in a little bit about sort of the importance of collaboration. And um, I know Yvonne mentioned the Northwest Atlantic Steel Consortium. And really, I think one of the themes of our, our talks tonight are how um, for seal work in the Northeast, it's really been a, a story of collaboration for quite some time now to, pe to piece together this 
the information that we know about these animals. Um, so lots of people flying surveys and out in the field. And I also wanna give just a little quick shout out to a lot of UMass Boston uh, undergrad students who have spent a lot of time tediously counting these aerial surveys as well, marking individual seals, thousands and thousands of images to pull together both the story of recolonization and actually for some of the sites um, where we've been able to survey for a long time, we've really been able to use these surveys to describe the recovery of gray seals in the Northeast US. So this is a map looks similar to the archeological map. Um, but what this is showing is actually the current sites where we find gray seals pupping. And so what we've been able to describe is sites in both, um, you can see sort of a whole cluster off the main coast here, and then um, a bunch of sites down around the Cape and Islands and in Nantucket Sound. And so there are nine sites that we currently monitor. Some of them, like Muskegon, we've monitored since the late 1980s, and there's been continuous pupping. Places like Monomoy, which I think Wendy might talk both about Muskegon and Monomoy a bit, maybe. Um, Monomoy pups were seen in the late 80s and early 90s, but really it was very um, hit or miss for a long time. And we think that was maybe related to coyote presence or some other things. Um, but since about 2009, there's been continuous pupping there. And so for some of these sites that ha we have longer data sets for, we've actually been able to um, use those data and estimate um, the rate of increase in the number of pups born at these sites. So the four sites that we have the, that are the most data rich, I'll say, are Muskegon and Monomoy Islands, which are, of course are down um, in, in the Cape and Islands area, and then Seal Island, which is in Outer Penobscot Bay, and Green Island, which is that small, was that small snowy island that I showed the picture of where pups have been since 1994. And if we take a look at these numbers without getting into too much detail, um, what we see is that these that there's been a fairly uh, substantial rate of increase over time at these sites for most of them. Um, you can see Muskegon and Seal are both around 12%. Green is actually minus 0.2. So green we actually think was already at carrying capacity when it was discovered in 1994. And then Monomoy really stands out here because it has this fairly significant rate of increase. And I just want to point out that the maximum rate of increase for pinnipeds, which are seals and sea lions um, and walruses, is 12%. So when we see rates like this, we think, wow, this is sort of the, the most quickly they can grow under ideal conditions, or perhaps some of this is also being driven by immigration. And especially when we see a rate like 26%, um, we need to think about, okay, animals are moving in from other areas. And so we know from those early brands and tags that, um, that Valerie showed some genetics and, and satellite tagging, we know that the animals in the US are really a mixture of animals born here and then animals immigrating from Canadian sites. Um, so I thought I'd share this picture here. This is a male gray seal. I took this picture in January of 2003 on Muskegon. And again, here you can see um, the brand, an individually recognizable brand. And so I sent that information up to our counterparts at the Department of Fisheries and Oceans in Canada, and they were able to uh, look up that brand and let me know the information um, about this animal. And why this is important, it's important for a couple of reasons. So this is Sable Island out here. Sable Island is the epicenter of the Northwest Atlantic gray seal population. There's close to 400,000 400, animals there. Um, and really why this is important to understand is because although things like protection and legal protection were important, the fact that there was also a healthy source population for individuals not that far away was another key piece of the recovery of this population. So this particular guy here, um, what I found out was he had been born in 1974 on Sable Island. So this was 2003. Um, and he had been seen on Sable Island in the 90s. And then I had spotted him in 2003. And so we know these animals are long lived. Um, and that they're moving between these sites and they're able to leave one site and actually set up shop and join a, a different pupping colony somewhere else. Um, the other piece that I wanted to point out is that when we think about the story of gray seal recovery and recolonization, we need to think a bit about habitat as well. And so we know these animals spend certainly a lot of time at sea, but they also need to return to land for crucial parts of their life cycle. So they need to give birth on land, they're mammals, so their pups need to breathe air um, and they need time to nurse their pups. And then they also return when they molt, which is when they lose their old fur and grow a new fur. So they're tied to both the land and water. And so when we start thinking about um, 
land habitat and we look at human island use, it's really changed over time. And that's another component that as these other things were happening, as legal protections were coming into place, as animals were moving out of Sable Island and in here, that's all important. But the other important piece is there was somewhere for them to go. There was habitat available. So if we think about um, places like uh, Seal Island in Maine up here. So Seal Island was a fish camp. So people stopped there all the time to dry their fish. So lots of human activity year round. It was then used for target practice by the Navy as was No Man's Island down here. Um, for those of you again, familiar with Muskegon, if we look back to say the early 1900s, we know that there were lots of hunting cabins and people were out all year round hunting ducks and fishing. And so, the way humans have used land has actually changed over time. And it's sort of the reverse of what we see in a lot of other populations. And that habitat has actually opened up for gray seals in terms of pupping sites. Um, and so that's something unique as well because the legal protection is important, but they also need habitat. Um, the other piece I should point out is that five of the nine pupping sites are actually now part of the US Fish and Wildlife Refuge system. And so really this importance of um, a place for them to come and use as well. And so what I think is sort of the take home messages about the gray seal recovery and recolonization is really that um, certainly legal protection was important. Um, the source population was important. The way we behave in terms of our island use is important. And then also some of the biological features of the species that they are able to disperse widely. They are able to breed on different types of substrate, whether it's sandy beaches or rocky uh, islands or ice. Um, they are generalist in terms of what they feed on. They also have a fairly uh, quick rate of increase for large mammals. And so the story of the gray seal is really lots of different pieces together that allowed for this recovery that we see today. That's, and with that, I will stop sharing my screen and hand the mic uh, to Wendy. Working on getting my slides up here. Okay, they should be showing. Are they up now? Okay, excellent. And you can hear me okay. Okay, so my name is Wendy Purrier. I currently work at Tufts University. And it has been my pleasure over the years to be able to enter into this work from the perspective of trying to get a better understanding of seal health and looking at the overall role of the ecosystem as well and how all of these other uh, additional factors feed into the health of a species, but also the health of a region. And it really can go very large and you can even say the health of the globe because we are all very interconnected. So these are the questions that we have been able to pursue with the work that we've been doing uh, with the gray seal population here in the region. If my slides decide to advance. There we go. So an important thing to realize, and I think it's something that is easy for us to, to lose sight of a little as humans, is that other animals suffer from a lot of the same sort of things as we do. Uh, seals also catch viruses. And something that we are all personally experiencing these days, respiratory viruses, are also a large problem for seals. The two primary viruses that have posed a problem in these seal populations are influenza and morbillivirus. So morbillivirus is part of a family of viruses that also includes measles, which can infect humans. But then there are several other different forms of morbillivirus, one of which is specific to pinnipeds. And the influenza and morbilliviruses have been known for the last several decades, going back to the late seventies, to be able to cause these unusual mortality events. And that just basically means that there is a large number of animals that die that is larger than the number you would expect to die in an average year. So it's an unusual mortality. And one of the reasons uh, that, two of the reasons that are typically associated with this are these viruses. So we've known that there are these unusual mortality events that can happen. And we've wanted to understand more about what exactly is going on out in the wild. Is it just these punctuated mortality events or is there a bigger issue? 
And as we have all learned very well with respiratory viruses, uh, as you put a lot of animals or a lot of individuals into contact with each other, you have a lot of opportunities for spread. And social distancing has uh, clearly not caught on with the seal population. And as Stephanie has mentioned uh, with the, the recovery of the population, this is something that we're looking even more closely into of how this may be impacting disease, these changing conditions. So to address this question, we've gone out to the three primary rookeries that are within the region. Uh, going back to 2013, we've been looking at these questions of health on Muskegon Island, uh, going right up through current times. We were out there this past January. And then on Monomoy, we started there in 2015, and in 2018 added Great Point as well to these health assessments. So for the next few minutes, I'm gonna give you kind of a, a quick whirlwind tour of six to 12 minutes in the life of a gray seal pup off of Cape Cod in the winter when our research <laughs> crew is around. So how do we do these health assessments without fail? My cat likes to show up while I'm presenting, pardon her. So first, we obviously need to go out to the field. We do a lot of our work out on Monomoy. So what I'm showing you here is actually a picture from Monomoy Island. And the seal pups are grown in, are born in the middle of the winter, which is, um, makes for some interesting challenging conditions to go out and to sample. So we're often dealing with some pretty uh, intense weather as we go out to try to sample these animals. And anybody who is local to the region knows that boating small crafts in the winter is a tricky feat in and of itself. So we need to get to these locations. Once we're out on Monomoy, we stay out there for uh, several days, as much as up to five days at a time. So we bring out all of our supplies of food, of safety supplies, our gear, to be able to set up camp and to do our sampling on the island. And then we stay in the lighthouse that is out there on Monomoy, generously provided uh, by the Monomoy Refuge. And we do all of our sample processing as much as we can in the field there by headlamp. Until recently, they have just upgraded and we now have solar, solar panels out there. So we have light now, but until recently it was by, by headlamp. Once we added a uh, great point to the mix, our conditions became much more luxurious. So uh, we get heavily spoiled on Nantucket and the, the UMass field station is incredible luxury. And we've, uh, Yvonne and, and the rest of the team can actually drive us down to the seals and instead of us schlepping the big heavy sleds down along. So the conditions there are much more comfortable. We have a proper lab to work in in the evenings, uh, but the questions are all the same at both locations. So we're collecting a whole suite of samples for biological sampling when we're out there. Uh, again, we're only focusing on the weaned pups when we're out there doing the sampling. And this is during January and February because that's when the pups are there. We typically across the region, so including all of those rookery, rookeries, we cover about a hundred pups a year, give or take. And to date we have sampled from about a thousand live pups. There's a whole suite of samples that we collect and I don't expect you to process this long list of things here on the side. I'll step through it a little bit more slowly, but really just to convey the fact that there is a lot of different information that's being looked at. So we handle the animals for somewhere between six to 12 minutes before we release them. And as Andrea will talk about in more depth after the one of the beautiful things about the, the consortium is that there is so much collaboration that happens that if we're gonna have hands on an animal, we are trying to answer all possible angles that anybody has expertise on and that we can weave together to try to understand the, the larger story with this whole population. So in order to get these samples, the first thing one has to do is find a pup uh, that tends to be trickier on Monomoy where it's a little more spread out and there's more vegetation. Uh, it tends to be a little easier on Great Point and Muskegon, but they can still surprise you how well they can hide in the grass sometimes. And then how do you catch a pup? You catch a pup in a special pup bag, as it turns out. So here you can see the pup is here. So you approach the bag with a special seal bag, and then that goes over the pup. Be able to safely scoop it up. There are handles on the side of the bag, and then you bring the pup back to the location where you're going to do the sampling and take the morphometrics and uh, collect all the information that you need there. Then we return it back to the location where it had been captured from. So what does sampling look like? Restraint is a physical restraint where the animal is just uh, held down on the ground. We're not actually sitting and putting weight on the animal. It's holding them so that their, their head is immobilized while we're doing our sampling. 
And then we collect a whole suite of morph metrics where we're looking at the length and the girth of the animal and taking measurements on the flippers. And all of these measurements actually feed in to be able to look at just an overall general measure of health. So we can look at body condition based on these measurements that we take. And you can see here a nice, healthy, robust animal. And then there are definitely times where we see animals that are not so robust. Those morphometrics help us to actually put a number onto that. We also collect a number of swabs from the animals as well as whiskers and lanugo, some of that white fluffy fur that is first on them. And from that, we're able to collect information looking at those viruses that I mentioned at the beginning, the respiratory viruses, influenza and morbili virus. And then we can also get from the whisker and the lanugo, that white fluffy hair, uh, information about diet and contaminants and several other things that collaborators are able to look at as well. So blood samples that we collect from the animals are extremely valuable. We're able to get lots of information from those samples to include antibodies against a whole suite of different pathogens, look at overall immune health, look at contaminants that are in the animals. Um, and that provides a really broad stroke of information of what is going on with the health of those animals. We also collect flipper biopsies where we apply a tag to the animal's flipper. And from that small little biopsy, it's, it's basically, well, it's the same sort of tag that's used for like cattle tags. And it's basically you know, almost like piercing the ear. And that little bit of biopsy that we get, we're able to get genetic information off of. And in some cases, the animals are fit with a satellite tag. So if you've ever, ever seen an animal out and about with this odd looking like glorified weird old school cell phone, kind of glued to the back of its neck, that's what it is. And what this provides is real time-ish. So when the data feeds back in, tracks of where the animal is, so here to orient, we're down at Cape Cod here. So it gives information about where the animal is traveling to. And this is obviously very valuable for several different reasons of trying to understand where they're moving to and where they're spending their time. Uh, we can also get information to some inferences about perhaps where they're where they're foraging and where they may or may not be transmitting. Um, if they had influenza, where did they travel to that animal that had influenza? So just a broad stroke of some of the sorts of information that we get is that seals in this region we have found do indeed have influenza. Uh, we find it each of the years that we have looked, it ebbs and flows as to the absolute level that we detect, um, but that's really not surprising with any sort of infectious agent. And we have found it consistently anywhere from 5% up to 20% of the pups that we will pick up influenza in. Now, sometimes this can feel a little bit alarming if you haven't thought about the idea that there might be influenza in seals before. Uh, so I definitely wanna put into perspective that seals are not particularly special in this regard. Lots of animals get influenza. Uh, obviously we get influenza. Wild birds are typically thought of as the main reservoir where all sorts of different forms of influenza circulate out there. And there's a whole range of animals that also end up getting influenza. So we're trying to understand how all of these animals interact and connect to each other and what it means for the health of that individual species as well. And then just to do another uh, large snapshot of some of the, the things that we find, because we have these different rookeries that are there um, available to be able to study, we have these great opportunities to be able to look at whether or not there are any differences in health in these different regions. So even though it is all within Cape Cod, they are their own distinct ecosystems. And what we've found is that, for example, with influenza, even though we detect that across the board in all of the, the locations that we've looked, we end up finding almost almost each year, we end up finding a higher amount of influenza in the animals that are on Muskegon. In contrast, if we go to Monomoy, we end up finding a higher amount of the animals on Monomoy have morbili virus. And then on Great Point, there's a whole different set of things going on there where we actually have not picked up virus very much at Great Point and the animals that are there. But what we do see is consistently from year to year, the body condition and the pups that are at Grave Point are substantially worse than those on Muskegon or Monomoy. So this all provides some little bits of, of clues and insights for us to try to understand some of the external factors that might be impacting the health of the species. And just to give a, a really 
quick overview of what some of those things might be. These could include things such as interspecies interactions. So whether it is uh, how prevalent sharks are, for example, in one region versus another within the Cape for the seals, um, their prey availability in one region versus another, the other species that they're overlapping with. So we know that influenza is very prevalent in a number of different uh, coastal birds. So it could be the situation where they're having exposure to animals that are carrying that virus in one rookery, but not another. Uh, actually, Stephanie had mentioned the um, coyotes on Monomoy as a possible interaction as well. Population dynamics, again, as the, the population increases and you have a higher density of animals and they're coming into more frequent contact with each other, this could be impacting differences in disease across those different rookeries. Maternal health, you may have different animals going to different rookeries based on their experience of how young or they are, how mature they are, how experienced they are um, as being a mom. And several environmental external factors. Uh, the, the region around the Gulf of Maine is undergoing very rapid change as is the whole whole globe, but the, the water in the Gulf of Maine is one of the most rapidly warming bodies of water. And that impacts the movement of animals, not only the seals, but here regionally, but also seals that are coming down and other marine mammals that are coming down from the higher latitudes and animals that are moving up from the lower latitudes. Um, and just this whole shifting of where both prey and predator species are, as well as the external stress of the water is, hot, is warmer, so that makes it more difficult for the animal to be able to cool itself and all these other things can impact immune health and then impact disease susceptibility. So really just to, to wrap up on the statement that even though the population is rebounding and recovering, we do continue to keep a very watchful eye on the individual species, but also the region and also the much broader uh, ecological story as well, because the health of each species impacts the health of all of us. And I am going to wrap up there and hand it over to Andrea. Awesome. Thanks, Wendy. Let's see if I can share screen fast here. Uh... <laughs> I need to stop sharing mine. Okay. It's always, always a challenge for me. Okay, hold on. Let's see if we can do this. Share your screen. And all right, is it up? Can you hear me? All Perfect. good. Awesome. <laughs> um, thanks for that. That's um, a, a perfect way to, to segue, I guess, into the, the view from afar to why the consortium exists. And I guess I should introduce myself too. I always forget to do that. Um, so I'm um, Andrea Bogomolny or Dre as my friends call me. And um, I'm the chair of the Northwest Atlantic Seal Research Consortium and many other hats, but the one I feel so um, grateful to be part of is actually this consortium and the fact that I believe in the seal community, and I, I always blame Stephanie for this, for bringing me in two decades ago, has always been so welcoming and inclusive. And it's something that's always been so important to me and um, to share with you that sort of this, this consortium of people that have come about. And I just really wanted to give that background about who we are, what we do, why we exist, and hopefully some of the stories that have come out of the consortium and the work ahead. So you guys, Stephanie and Wendy are, are such great um, examples of how wonderful it is when we can maximize what we do and work together and collaborate. So thank you. Um, so the way I wanted to present this is really, I was thinking, well, you know, how, how do I explain why NASERC exists, as we say NASERC, not NASCAR? Um, and I really wanted to present how we have this community-based approach to really address the challenges of, of rebounding species in the region. And where to start in the story? That was the other tough part. Where do I start? Um, and I really just wanted to start in a place that, that Stephanie talked about and sort of begin the story of, you know, go from the ancient history to some point in history and talk about it. But it's with the Marine Mammal Protection Act. And it's a part of the, the law that was passed that's often forgotten. And that is that the primary objective of this law was the management um, to maintain the health and stability of the marine ecosystem. So a little 
well-known fact, it's actually the first U.S. ecosystem-based management law that's been passed by the U.S. And it's it's fascinating just to see how it's worked. And, and there are success stories and gray seals and rubber seals are an example of that conservation success story, which back in the, as, as Stephanie brought up, we were at a point where these animals were extirpated from the region locally and didn't know what was gonna happen um, without that source population coming in. So yay, fast forward, right? Success, we're, we're at this good point. Um, and this is a picture of Ms. Skeget that uh, from the other side of what Stephanie presented of you know pups and moms and you know bulls out at sea. And this is what we see now, but it took a long time that's often forgotten to get here. So if you were around 80 years ago, not even that long ago, um, again, when Valerie was doing her flights and her surveys, there were only a few animals and it was a different baseline and different place than we are today. And that's often forgotten as well. So that is the success. And um, Stephanie was the first one to bring me out to Muskegon and I stayed at the field station back then on Nantucket and it, it changed my life and my perspective too. Um, so with the success, we also have conflict. Imagine that. We have a lot of animals in our water. And that's where the consortium really comes in. And I'd say my interest, which um, really started with understanding ocean and human health and how seals fit into it. And the part of the story that was always forgotten in the work was how do the humans fit into this? Why are we not talking more about these conflicts and just putting it out on the table, you know, put the elephant in the room and talk about it. Um, and there are a lot of conflicts to talk about and figure out and resolve so that we can understand the health of our ocean. And these are just some, I always put these up because I think they're so um, illustrative of, of the thought of how the perceptions are with seals in this region. And um, Jennifer Jackman did a great survey on Nantucket about perceptions of, of seals in the region. And these are headlines that you could swear it came out of the 1800s, but they're actually from, you know, about maybe five, five, six years ago. Um, but it's gray seal population, plague or pleasure. New England fishermen and residents call uh, back a call of exploding gray seal population. The seals are like vermin. And that's the type of attitude that's come up with this increasing population um, for, for directly being blamed for shark attacks. Um, not the sharks, but the seals, just to make that clear about what's been put in the media and perception. Um, the seal population is exploding on Nantucket. That's a common phrase. Um, they draw fans and bows. There's talk about culling. Um, they're taking over the beaches. Um, it goes on and on and on until we actually, there was a, a group on Nantucket as well um, that was called the Seal Abatement Coalition really and then this call for for calls came about to the point where it actually um was brought up even oh i forgot this one seal tsunami almost forgot it's one of my favorite phrases um but where it was called by local officials on the cape that this this should happen that we should have a call and the conversations are difficult and they are very um heated and i really truly believe that in order to to understand what to do with this population, we have to talk about it. And that's where the consortium comes in, is it, it was a way to figure out how we can have these conversations and ask these questions, where do we go from here with all this tension, with all these questions that we still have yet to answer. And so the way to do this is to address that disconnect. And that's again, where the consortium comes in. So um, many people had been meeting um, since the 1990s The New England Aquarium had a meeting back in 95 when there were just a few seals and people were kind of uh, concerned about the fact that they were um, maybe too many of them up in Maine. There was issues with aquaculture back in the day. Those were the, the hot topics. Um, and we sort of came together as a group, a few of us, to, to reinvigorate this idea of meeting. And it really started in 2008, where we all got together, figured out a way to find funds to bring people together from all over the country, actually, to build community. And that's what we did. We started the Northwest Atlantic Seal Research Consortium. And we are virtual and we are a, a participant volunteer group. And this is our current website. And something that's important to mention is that we're actually um, going to be based at UMass Boston at the School for the Environment is our new home base. Currently, our website is nasart.hui.edu, but we are moving very soon um, to be more connected, actually. I'm so, so thrilled um, to the field station, even, and, and to UMass um, in that respect. And um, our, our goal is really, as our website or our virtual presence 
prioritizes is priorities. What are we looking at? What are the conversations? How do we engage people? What workshops can we hold in order to gain these conversations and get the people in the room who, who may not already be in the room? And that's also critical. Um, we don't want to be, as we say, preaching to the choir or be our own echo chamber. We really um, are more than just um, scientists. We're scientists, resource managers, the fishing community. And the goal is really to address these data gaps that exist um, with this increasing population, whether it's population biology or fishery interactions, disease and health, all of these different questions, shark interactions, um, ecology are so critical. And the mission of the consortium in, in trying to refine what it is we're actually trying to do really is facilitating conversation and working collaboratively to improve our understanding of the ecological role of seals in the Northwest Atlantic. And that idea really encompasses the life of these animals whether that's um, what, what they might be sick from, what impacts their health, um, how much are they eating. It all really revolves around the system and the ecosystem that they're in. So that's the mission of the consortium. And again, we are scientists, fishermen, students, business owners, managers, basically anyone who shares an interest in unbiased scientific research to understand the ecological role of seals. And that part remains critical. And we're very um, honored and proud to say that we've been recognized in scientific literature in the acknowledgement and actually the papers themselves as a mechanism to increase this dialogue and this conversation. So it's something that we hold very important. And again, it's um, we're participants, we're not members. And so when we say we're part of this consortium speaking, it's because we choose to collaborate, we choose to share information. Um, sometimes it's difficult, sometimes the conversations lead to more questions instead of answers, but that's what we intend to do. And so we've had six meetings um, since we formed in 2008, and those meetings have led to to more and more sort of um, offshoots, I guess, or questions of, of what we need to do as, as a group of people interested in these issues of healthy ecosystems. Um, and one of the uh, really interesting, and for me, I'm glad you showed the, the picture of the, the um, uh, branded seal is trying to understand how we capture this information of now many researchers across borders to understand where animals go. We are, we are researchers who are putting tags on them. There's stranding organizations, there's fishery bycatch where there's tags. And also these animals have these unique markings as Valerie's, um, I love that table indicated that you can see these animals year after year, not because we put something physically on them, but because they have these unique patterns. And so we started the Marine Animal Identification Network named at hui.edu, which will hopefully stay with the same, same content and, and beautiful site that's been created on the back end and front end where you can go in and report sightings. Um, we've had sightings come in from California. We've actually had sightings come in from the deep sea that were not seal related at all, but it's still a way to capture these unknowns and try and connect people um, to, to where these animals may have been, who tagged them. And it's it's just been such an amazing way to tell the story of these researchers and these individual animals. So I just wanted to give, since I could probably talk all day about the, the amazing work of everybody collaborating in the consortium, some of like the, the bigger things that we're contending with or how our interactions and collaborations really grow and how strong and important they are. Um, we have a, a growing trend here on the Cape, which is provisioning or basically it's feeding seals. And this is something of concern. I think for a lot of people, there's a, a health threat, there's a safety threat, there's a, a behavior change to these animals and basically the intention is not harmful. I'm sure people want to get closer and understand these animals, but the consequences can be very um, not so great, I guess, if we'll put it that way. But it's been something we've been seeing more and more as people want to interact with these animals for better or for worse. And it has these unintended consequences of causing behavior changes, as I said. And this is an animal that's lovingly named as Potato or Job of the Seal in Chatham at the Fish Pier, um, who's a little bit more on your healthy body condition size, Wendy, maybe a little too much um, from being fed. And that's not what we want. And we also don't want this. This was from Vancouver um, in Canada, where a sea lion became very aggressive because it had been 
fed. And so it was, wasn't was being fed and it actually uh, grabbed somebody from the dock and, and brought this girl underwater. So we don't want to see that. So what do we do proactively and have these hard conversations to, to make these things not happen here? And that's where these collaborations become so important. So we started um, at the consortium teaming up with the White Shark Conservancy and the Fisheries Alliance in Chatham um, to, to be peer hosts with their peer host program that they've already had for eight years. It's a great, great, great program. And team up all three organizations together to be peer hosts on the deck to be able to educate people. And again, these things aren't happening with, with bad intentions, but they can have negative consequences. And so just informing and educating has been such a, an amazing partnership. And one of the other partnerships that's come from that trying to give knowledge and education is being able to help um, provide information to their learning book that's passed out, thousands are printed and given to kids and adults, they're fun, um, where you can color and learn about the species, the fishing, um, the seals, the sharks. And it's been a really great collaboration of, of maybe people would think unlikely partners when in fact we all have that common goal of, of having healthy, sustainable oceans. Um, and in case this is another example um, to share, in case you haven't heard, there are sharks around Cape Cod. Um, this is something that we all contend with and it's controversial and conflict and people have a lot of feeling and emotion behind it. But there's a lot of education that needs to happen to get to get to the point where we can talk to the public, have conversations, do the science, which is obviously very important. And part of that is just simply education and getting information out. And many times the role of the consortium is correcting misinformation. I think we spend a lot more of our time um, talking to media, I would say in the last month, um, correcting misinformation and trying to, I say, play whack-a-mole with media getting ahead of the story to make sure that misinformation doesn't persist. Um, so that the stories that come out are actually the science that comes out and not the perceptions that might be held because of those feelings and those conflict um, uh, pieces that we all have. So um, we're involved in, in, in conversations, in, in um, lectures. Uh, one of the most um, impactful moments I think of my life was being at the Wellfleet Town meeting after the fatal shark attack as a, a SEAL person representing the consortium to give information to people who really were looking for um, sound, scientific, unbiased information and a, an ear to listen. And that's what I truly think the consortium does a good job of doing, hopefully, is, is listening to people in those, those um, interests in conversation. So giving information out that's correct is very important. And part of that is working with the White Shark Conservancy years ago. Again, very grateful for them. They are the ones that helped put this together um, and actually printed these um, pamphlets to talk about what a healthy ocean is and how healthy predators are necessary for a healthy ocean and talk about these things together, not as separate predator or prey or separate researchers, but working together to talk about this story as a whole so our community can understand what a successful rebounding population is, why it may be important and how it brings us to healthy oceans. And with that, I will leave it. This was my um, um, contribution to that learning book and of all, you know, doesn't matter PhD, all of that papers written. I'm so happy I can have a page in this coloring book and I'm totally serious. Um, just to really get that message to people that that is the common goal for all of us is working toward a healthy ocean for all. And that's what these animals can really tell us about and why seals to me are so worthwhile putting all this effort and energy and in, in telling people about and, and sharing the information with. And with that, I will end um, and turn it over, I guess, unshare my screen. <laughs> Let me do that. Oof, unshare. Stop sharing. Thank you, everybody. Um, this is great. So we're we're entering the second half of our event this evening, and um, we are going to entertain questions. If you're watching on YouTube and you're on the computer, there is a um, chat box, and you can write your question in there. I haven't seen any. I've seen some comments thanking us for this, thanking our scientists for, for putting this on. Um, but I have some questions, so I can start this off. Um, I, there are so many things we could discuss, It's, but I'll start with, um, with this one. Um, it must be really challenging to be looking at a population that is on the rebound um, at the same time that climate change is showing us these higher 
temperatures in in our area for sure. Um, it, do you does anyone see a trend or an effect? Is that something that can be teased out, or do, do you know if climate change is affecting the rebounding population? So, I'll go ahead, Stephanie. No, no, no. Um, I mean, I think we're, I'm not sure we have sort of any sort of cause and effect type of, of things yet, but I think certainly we know there are, you know, physiological boundaries for these animals um, that are going to be impacted. I love the cat, Wendy. <laughs> I, I can't get rid of her. Um, you know, they <laughs> have a her. lot of plas plasticity um, in ter or flexibility in terms of, you know, a lot of things that they do, including what type of substrate they up on what they eat and things like that. But certainly um, we know they are, you know, from an evolutionary standpoint, gray seals are ice seals. And so that's why they're born with that white fur. And in parts of their range, they still are pupping. You go to the Gulf of St. Lawrence, those animals are on ice or you go to the Baltic Sea. So, I mean, physiologically at some point, I would think, you know, there's a limitation to where they're gonna be found. So that, I think there's that piece. Um, and then of course, I think all of the unintended or not yet recognized changes that some of the that climate change is going to have on on their ecosystem you know whether it's disease or prey availability or those types of things so yeah i was going to say that same thing of of not not direct direct but we know you know prey if your food moves you have to move and and keeping an eye on the shift in species and also the biology and, and life history of these animals of being generalists of being able to to contend with changes is a part of their their life history and success story as a species but it's not in if you look to what happens say in california with the bird or i should say the pacific coast um, with the pacific blob where things happen really fast the waters warm very quickly and it was pinnipeds pinnipeds were that that central um, species that was the indicator of something was wrong with the system and we saw increased mortality decreased health you know uh, maternal uh, uh, maternal health was compromised basically so if things happen quickly those are the stories I think to really lean on to pay attention to of what we see with stranding networks with animals at um, you know great point having less a healthy body condition and seeing how that changes overall. So those are the types of things that I would think we need to be looking for and why, again, it's really important to look for seals. And then the other piece to that, which I, I was thinking is an interest and has been brought up is um, we are starting to pick up after these long-term data sets are collected. So we do a survey of seals at the Isla Shoals in Maine. And one of the things one of my students actually uh, mentioned she had never seen molting. So there's students that have never seen, you know, animals molt. And there's this, it's this very strange looking animal that's molting. And she asked the question, are, is that changing over time? And so there, those are things, little pieces of information that might be really good to tease out as the, when they molt different, is that shifting? Is that changing? Which could very much affect their physiological health in the long term. So those are little clues right now that I think are just very important to look at personally. So I just echo all of that and expand on it a little bit. To me, I think one of the most one of the most direct observable impacts of the changing climate is the shifting species. So all all species have pathogens that they have co-evolved with over time and have come to be able to to deal with in a lot of cases. That's the whole idea of a reservoir species. So once a virus, for example, has become established in a species, it becomes a reservoir where it no longer necessarily makes that animal sick. It just hangs out there, it propagates, the animal lives its life, everybody goes about their business. But then when you have that animal comes into contact with a, what's referred to as a naive animal, so a host that has not experienced that virus before us with COVID, you suddenly have this situation where the species is very susceptible and you have these huge disease outbreaks where the reservoir animal did not have that problem. So as we have a shifting of species, as you have animals coming down from the Arctic because either their habitat or their food supply has been depleted or animals that are coming up from the Southern latitudes because now the water is warmer up here and now they're coming up and exploring further up, they're coming into contact with each other in ways that they hadn't before. 
and that gives the opportunity for pathogens to pass back and forth in ways that they hadn't before. So I think that's, at least from, from the pathogen point of view, one of the more um, prominent things that, that I'm watching for in regards to climate change. Thank you. That's, um, it's just really interesting. It, it's complicated when you look at these big uh, nets of life. We do have a question from J uh, Jillian Drury. She would like to know, is there any way to calculate when we think the gray seal population will self-regulate or reach carrying capacity? People ask, how long will it take? Steph? Steph? Yeah. <laughs> um, so yes, a couple of things about that. Um, so I know people often ask, you know, how many animals are supposed to be here? How many seals are there supposed to be? And, you know, that really gets into this idea of carrying capacity. And so all populations have carrying capacity in any ecosystem. And that is just basically dependent on other species and available resources, how many individuals in a population can be sustained in that given site. Um, and so nature does regulate itself, right? Um, if there's only so much food or so much space or competition for mates or whatever it is, all those things are gonna influence how many individuals there are. Um, I would like to point out that we know from genetic studies and also as we've talked about the branded and tagged animals that really when we think about um, seals or gray seals at least, it's really, a, it's a Northwest Atlantic population. And so we need to think about maybe what we're seeing in Nantucket Sound in the context of what's happening in this whole area and what's happening in the Gulf of St. Lawrence and on Sable Island and, and in parts of Maine because we know that there's movement. So what's happening on Sable Island is gonna also influence what's happening on Muskegon or Monomoy or wherever we're looking in the US because individuals are moving. Um, and we do know Sable Island is an extremely well studied site. Um, there, there's been sort of annual information from the 1970s and there's a lot of of life history information. And what Sable Island researchers are seeing is that there are some changing vital rates. So what they're seeing um, after about 25 years of exponential growth, they're seeing that things like the age at first reproduction, so the age um, of a female when she has her first pup is getting older. So say it was maybe three or four for a while, now it's closer to six. Um, and so that's gonna be an influence of things like body condition, right? And maturity that um, the more you can grow more quickly, you can mature more quickly. If you have to spend more time looking for food, you're gonna delay reproduction, right? Till you reach a certain side. Um, they're also seeing a decrease in juvenile survival. And so that's another um, sort of life history parameter that is indicative of a population that is starting to slow. And so for the Northwest Atlantic population, we are certainly seeing changes in those vital rates that would indicate that, that there is this shift of some regulation. Um, and that we're sort of, you know, closer to carrying capacity than we were 15 or 20 years ago. Um, for the U.S. sites, we don't have a lot of that specific life history information for, say, Muskegon. But I think, again, knowing there's also a lot of movement and that these these areas are interconnected, that we are we are seeing some of those changes that are indicating, you know, we're approaching, um, we're slowing down and, and potentially approaching carrying capacity. Um, but the hard thing to too is again, carrying capacity is not static. It's not set in time. It's influenced by all these other factors. And so um, what carrying capacity looked like in say 1900 is different than what carrying capacity looked like in 1980, which is different than what carrying capacity probably is today. So hopefully that answers that question. It seems to have, but um, Jillian, please um, pipe in if it didn't. Um, I had some thoughts as you were uh, showing your images and wondered um, what the historical sort of very old uh, range of seals is, or do, does, do you know that? And perhaps you, you showed that and I, I missed it, um, but sort of archeologically, um, do we have an idea of the the range, I mean, it, it, what, what's the most southern or the warmest area that seals have been populating? So are you asking what their sort of historic range in terms of like latitudinal range or historic population size? Uh, sure answer. 
uh, both, but I was I was uh, interested initially in the uh, the the geo geographical range. Yeah, so there are records from down into the Mid Atlantic uh, archaeological records, and there are actually um, there are seals found in the Mid Atlantic again. So as these populations have recovered, um, they have moved further south as well, south of Nantucket, I should say. Um, and we know historically there are some sites that, historic archaeological sites that also have some uh, seal remains in them. Um, in terms of thinking about, well, how many seals were here and, you know, is that some sort of target? We really don't have, um, we aren't able to estimate that. So, um, you know, there have been some studies, for example, there was a study on at the Turner Farm site, which is in North Haven, uh, Maine, and they sort of uh, Spies and Lewis were the authors and they were able to sort of look from 2500 BCE through about 1600 and they saw that, you know, seal hunting went from sort of seasonal to a year round activity. It appeared to become a more important source of food, but it's not really, you can't sort of reconstruct the population. And again, in some parts of the world, so say in places like Norway and Sweden, their bounty records are meticulous and they've been able to use those to sort of backcast you know, what was the population size, say in 1850, knowing all the bounties. Um, but as I mentioned, there was a lot of cheating in the bounties. And so we can't really use those to actually estimate historic populations. So we more have presence absence. Uh, and just, just add to that too, to give, you know, the credit to, to people working on this work and working together is Christina um, Kamen's work, looking at genomics too is really fascinating, suggesting that we might've had bigger populations just based on genomic information. And I think it's just so fascinating how much we don't know, but the tools that may become available to understand what that, you know, number, I, you know, or at least understanding what it could be. It's, um, there's so much, so much that we might be able to figure out, but haven't yet. Yeah, that's a great point that just sort of the, the, the lower genetic diversity than we would expect sort of, Christina was able to look at um, genetics from archeological samples and sort of find certain markers in there that we don't find in the current population, which is indicative of a bottleneck event that, that the population was reduced. That's a great, great point, Dre. Yeah, just give so many people doing great work and it's yeah. all so, so interesting. Yeah, I know I'm just waiting to hear more. She needs to publish more, I wanna hear more. <laughs> Wendy, um, any thoughts on why the Great Point population seems to be less robust or is less robust looking? We've done a lot of speculating on this and trying to figure out. Because um, the first year we thought maybe it was just an oddity and then we saw it again the second year and we saw it again the third year. And this is a, a consistent difference that we're seeing at that site. Um, I think two of our, our favored hypotheses, well maybe three of our favorite ideas right now are in part that there might be, this is total speculation. So in part, it might be kind of a real estate game that Muskegon, as far as repopulating down here, Muskegon was the first where you started to see the high numbers establishing the rookery there. And it tends to be that animals have a high level of site fidelity. They tend to come back to the same location. There's obviously exceptions, but as a broad rule, they tend to come back to the same location year after year to have their pups. So the animals that have established themselves on Muskegon Muskega is a very remote location. Um, you know, there's almost no human interference going on there at all. So you could imagine that that's kind of the, the comfortable place to be as far as if you wanna go there and have your pup. And then as that started to become more populated then perhaps the next kind of wave of animals established themselves on Monomoy, which is also remote, but you have more interaction there. You're closer to the mainland. You're right there by the seashore. There's a higher shark presence than are able to get into the shoals around Muskega. That's changing all the time, but again, broad strokes here. So perhaps that's not quite as desirable of a place to go and have your pups, but if Muskegon is already starting to get a little cozy, maybe you choose to go to Monomoy. And then as Monomoy is becoming a little more cozy, maybe you go and look for yet another place. Perhaps from the perspective of a seal mom looking to have her pup, Great Point is potentially not the best option because you do have more access to human interaction there. 
So you're going to have a lot more humans that are potentially coming down the beach than you're ever going to have if you're on a ski gift. So it could simply be the case that the animals that are either less established or less, um, less fit, or perhaps they have some other, um, just they're not as robust, whether it's a nutritional issue or an immune issue, but for some reason they end up going to the great point. And because of the fact that they may be compromised in some way themselves from a health perspective, their pups may therefore be less healthy. So that's a, a whole lot of hand waving of some speculation that makes some sense based on what we see, but all things that would need further data on it. Um, and then the other that ties into that is it might simply be a matter of more opportunities for human interaction happening there. So potentially the moms may uh, wean their pups sooner at a location like Great Point where you have a Jeep that's coming down the beach where you're not gonna have that on Muskegon. So perhaps those, those pups are left on their own sooner than, than they would have been otherwise and therefore not able to do as well. I don't know if anybody else wants to offer some additional ideas, but. Now, I was going to offer an idea, but this is like part of that great conversation of, you know, if you had all the resources at your disposal, how would you, how would you figure it out? What would you do? I think trying to get at the, the mother pup pair really is the ultimate uh, black box that needs to be addressed to really be able to answer that question. Because I think all of the ideas that we've all bounced around in various various manners all kind of come back to the health of the mom or the experience of the mom or the age of the mom or interference with the mom when she has had her pup. So it, it all comes back to the mom. And we're doing all of our work on the pups um, yeah. for several reasons, but one of which is practicality. You can handle a 60 to 100 pound pup, not so much a 600 to 800 pound adult as easily. So we, we just don't have that information on the mom. So all the resources in the world, I think that is what we would ultimately need to be able to really address that question. Um, I had another question. When you collect all of these samples and you, um, you're looking at contaminants as well, um, so if they're coming off of the pup's whiskers, for example, or the, the hair, that is coming from the mother's diet ultimately. And um, I guess my question is twofold. Uh, are you finding any contaminants of concern? And I don't just mean in Nantucket, sort of across all of your sampling on um, the Eastern seaboard or your different sites. Uh, is one population more healthy than another? And is, um, is there any contaminants of concern that show up in general, I guess, in the literature? So I can start with that and then I will uh, also toss it to Andrea and Stephanie if they wanna jump in as well. But a lot of what we've done has actually been um, in collaboration with another amazing researcher, uh, Milton Levin, who's at University of Connecticut. And he has really pushed a lot of this contaminant work and being able to look at those questions. And Dre has also done some of this work in the past as well. So I'll, I'll let her chime in. But it's actually um, one of the slides I, I showed with the blood draw, there was a little card that had spots on it. And that is called a blood spot card. So from the blood draw, we're able to pull off a small sample of, uh, of that, that blood sample. And you can detect a whole host of contaminants within that sample. And the primary ones that we end up looking at are we meaning Milton <laughs> Levin. <laughs> it's his group that's running these assays. And then um, you know, we weave all of that information in together. Uh, so the royal we, Milton. So all of that data is primarily looking at pesticides and um, PCBs. And there has been, it's, it's preliminary, we need to have a larger data set of these being analyzed before we can say with more confidence. But we have seen that on Muskegon, those animals seem to have a higher level of pesticides that we detect than at the other locations. And on Monomoy, those animals seem to have a higher level of PCBs than what we detect on the other locations. And that could come down to, again, that idea of uh, maternal experience and maternal age. So in part, 
the mom is accumulating. So it's called bioaccumulation over the course of, of their life when they eat their food, that food has contaminants in it that's going to accumulate in the animal over time. And it tends to be the case that a first time mom offloads those contaminants that the PCBs are offloaded into the first pup. So, and that's not necessarily the case with pesticides. So that also kind of supports some of our, our hypotheses that we've had as a group that perhaps the animals on monomoy, those animals are newer moms and that's perhaps the first pup that they've had. And that's why you get a higher level of PCBs there because they're offloading in that first pup. And then also ties in really nicely with the fact that we see a higher level of the morbili virus at that location, because here I don't want to uh, take over too much because this was actually Dre's work where she was able to show that there is, I think you're muted still. Right. There is, go, 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 explain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, at least looking within a lab setting and then Dre, uh, keep me honest here. So the PCBs, if you have that exposure when you have morbili virus on there, it basically prolongs the amount of time that that virus can replicate. So it may therefore in a, a full animal actual setting and a, a live animal, if you have a higher level of PCBs and then you're exposed to that morbili virus, then potentially having that contaminant present in your body allows you to replicate the virus for a longer amount of time, which means you can shed it to more individuals, which means it can spread more at that site. So it's possible that those sorts of things all tie together, which comes back to the overarching theories, uh, overarching ideas that we've all uh, been trying to bring up tonight is that it's, it's not possible to just look at say viral infection in an animal or contaminants in an animal or recovery at this location. It is all so intricately entwined that it is absolutely crucial the way that this consortium works together to try to get all of these little pieces to try to feed them all together and see if we can try as a group to understand these bigger pictures. <laughs> yeah. I have a question from Eugene Gallagher. Uh, he's a professor at UMass Boston. Uh, you may have answered this um, while he was trying to figure out his Google password to log in. Do gray and harbor seals compete for food or do they partition the spatial regions to limit competition? So, want me to, should I start? Okay. Um, so that's a great question and we don't have a, a, a really great answer. Um, so they certainly, they overlap in space and time. Um, gray seals, adult gray seals are a lot bigger than harbor seals, um, but they certainly overlap in their prey as well. Um, what we have seen in parts of the US and certainly in parts of Canada and Europe where they overlap is oftentimes what we see is, is gray seals tend to increase in an area and harbor seals appear to be displaced by them. So if we go back to say data from the 1980s from Monomoy, there were sometimes you know 1500 harbor seals on Monomoy uh, in the spring and it's really rare to see harbor seals there now and there's you know 20 to 30 thousand gray seals there um, likewise on sable island there were harbor seals on sable island for a while they have been displaced for a couple of decades so it appears um that gray seals actually displace harbor seals um at least on haul out sites and then what that's doing to their sort of distribution in terms of their marine distribution that's that's a great question as well but there is this sort of from other areas and, and even some sites here that it looks like gray seals do displace harbor seals. So that is another, I think, really interesting question. I don't, you guys might have more to add about that. Uh, the only addition I have, which I think is also fascinating, and again, why we need more information and why the pieces are so important to put together with what people are doing is we've seen at the Isle of Shoals and that's like, you know, a little, microcosm of seals, but it's a pretty big, big haul out of animals where there's also harbor seal pupping and, and harbor and gray seals, is that the harbor seals have are, are tapering off and they sort of kind of took a nosedive in the last couple of years, especially after these unusual mortality events. And the gray seals were increasing and this is the first year and then 
have a couple data points for 2020, so we'll see what happens, but that they've actually reached almost the same exact amount, and that's over 10 years. So there's definitely, um, we see it, it, it's definitely decreasing year, year to year for harbor seals, but their partitioning on those shoals is really interesting. They're still going to the same, the same rocks every year. I mean, the same exact GPS point every year. So how that's going to play out if the gray seals, this is like to be continued, if the gray seals start surpassing the harbor seals there or not, how they start partitioning would be really interesting, especially for prime, you know, prime areas of haul out or safety from winds or, or boats and everything else that they're contending with out there. And it's, I know just one piece, but it is our backyard and it's, it's really fascinating and why those long-term data sets are, and students are so important. And it's hijacking the topic just a little bit because this isn't really about competition between the two species and uh, overlap of habitat, but overlap of habitat with the harbors and the grays. Um, it's also been incredibly fascinating and, and a, a mystery that a lot of us are involved in trying to sort out is that as both Stephanie and Dre have just said, the harbors and the grays can literally haul out together. And there's, Dre has a bunch of great pictures of there's a, a mix of them all together off of the Isle of Shoals, like literally right next to each other. But when we see infectious disease come through, it tends to be the case that for the most part, it really doesn't impact the gray seals. There are exceptions, but it tends to be that gray seals really, you have very little response to influenza, you have very real, little response to morbillivirus, virus, to um, a foci and herpes virus. And these are things that when the harbor seals get them, you get a mortality event and you get this much more um, dramatic response from those species. So they are clearly both physically in contact with each other and we can detect those pathogens in both species, but the harbor seals seem like they are much less uh, able to handle those infections than the gray seal is. So how that feeds into the overall um, to be continued story is, uh, is you know still to be seen, but it is a factor. Well, Thank you so much. Um, I'd love to keep throwing questions at you and continuing this discussion, but, um, and I, I'm looking for more questions from the people tuning in. I do not see any more, and uh, maybe that's a fortunate thing because we do have to look at wrapping up, but I would like to say, um, this is something I, I, a topic I would like to revisit down the road, maybe in the winter or in the fall. Um, we can reconvene with the same group or a slightly different set and continue this conversation. Uh, it's really fascinating and I thank you all so much. Um, again, th these three people are um, under the um, Northwest Atlantic Seal Research Consortium, which now finds itself at UMass Boston in the School for the Environment. And we thank very much uh, Dr. Stephanie Wood uh, Dr. Andrea Bogomoni and Dr. Wendy Currier. Um, we are so lucky uh, to have you spending time talking to us. And I really look forward to seeing you again this winter. I hope if um, <laughs> our COVID situation allows for that. And otherwise, um, thanks. Thank All you. Right. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you, everybody who joined in. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Yvonne. You're welcome. Thank <laughs> you.